welcome to episode 24 of the Film Inventories podcast. This is Jamie Benning talking to you from South East London at my home here. Hope you enjoyed the last episode, number 23, with Madeline Most. I had some nice feedback actually from several of you saying you did. It's always good for me to know that I'm on the right track and that you're enjoying these. Thanks as always to my now 47 patrons on Patreon. A couple more of you have joined since the last episode. I'm so grateful for your support. It's really, uh, really humbling and really does make my day when I see a, a new one of you joining up. If you'd like to support me, please visit patreon.com forward slash Jamie Benning. You can sign up for as little as one pound per creation or per month. You can put a cap on it um, if you wish. Uh, but generally, I only release two episodes a month anyway. And occasionally I'll release a free episode as well. I'll have one of those coming up maybe later this month if I can squeeze it in. So for this episode, number 24, April 2021, I have a conversation with director Peter MacDonald. I recorded this a couple of weeks ago when the weather here was suddenly warmer and uh, Peter was in fine fettle and was happy to answer all and any questions I had about his career as a cameraman, a second unit director and a director. I would love to talk with Peter some more as it's clear he has so many more stories about working with some of the great actors and directors of cinema, including you know, Attenborough, Guinness, Harris, Foreman, Borman, Henson, Donner, Lucas, Kirshner, Fossey, Bowie, Hackman, Minnelli, Streisand, Burton. I mean, it's just incredible, really. Before I spoke to him, and since I've spoken to him, I found myself going through some of his catalogue of films, wondering which shots were his and which were the first units. Despite not being known to many of us outside of the industry, Peter and his work are legendary among those that work inside. It was a real privilege to talk to him, and I hope very much to meet him and Madeline later this year. So here's my chat with director Peter MacDonald, and I'll be back at the end with a bit more jabbering on. So, Peter, how did you get involved in the film industry? What was your route in? My route in was um, I was working from school. I started, I got a job in Fleet Street. God knows how, because I've dyslexic. Uh, and uh, working for an Australian newspaper called the Australian Truth and Sportsman, which later Mr Murdoch owned. And they were the most miserable assholes I've ever worked with in my life. Um, <laughs> And I saw an advert in the, I think it's a magazine called The World Trade News, saying Pearl and Dima opened up a studio at Samothal and were looking for people to employ, camera crew, blah, blah, blah. And this, the editor's secretary, at the, it was very nice, she, and she wrote a letter for me to apply for this meeting. Because if I'd have done it, I'd still be <laughs> out of work. And it was very good. And I... Within a week, I had a meeting in Bond Street where Pearl and Dean were. They were a huge company. And somehow convinced them that the biggest love of my life was film. I didn't even have a brownie camera at the time, but I convinced them that that was always the thing in my life. And the guy there, Byron Doyd, his name is, a dapper little man that ran the show, was taken in. And a week later, I was at Southall International Film Studio and uh, doing, as a clapper boy, doing an effort for tomato ketchup. So I knew I was <laughs> heading for the big time. So that was the start. <laughs> it was all downhill after that. And that, is that a typical routine to start as a as a clapper loader? I mean, you know, my side of things on television, we have runners that you know they're running around making the tea, and they're they're sort of a, a gopher as such. It, it certainly was. Um, um, there was no film school then. Obviously, mm. the film school was, in my opinion, quite good because you learnt on the job. Because uh, not only excuse me, so you shoot that bird. So not only were you like a tea boy. You also had the responsibility of the clapper loader, it's called. So you looked after mm. the film. So you do, you're the only one that could screw up the whole day's work. <laughs> if you screwed up the film. I mean, a lot of people have fogged the film. People have fogged the film and then buried it in the back lots of pine wood, you know, so pretended it never happened. Of course, the following day, the Russians say, Where's the film? Well, I don't know. It was here somewhere. Anyway, I, I never had any uh, terrible screw ups like that. I had also there's some quite good 
teach was there, the cameraman, lovely old cameraman called Jeffrey Faithful, who'd been around forever. And he was very helpful, very pleasant. A few of the others were quite flash because Technicolor had just finished. As a, I don't know how you know about Technicolor. They employed all their own technicians and they went all over the world with the Technicolor camera. No one else was allowed to use it but them. So they become extremely flash people, you know, because they, without them, they couldn't shoot, you know. So I worked with these uh, two or three Technicolor technicians, so I say which now had finished, but they still had that attitude. But in a way, it's quite good because uh, they were very disciplined. So I learned a trade, and uh, there were other people there that were really charming and nice. So it's, it's a nice mix. So after that, um, I got really fed up with commercials. So they really are the most boring thing in the world. And at Walton Studios, which was just looking at the window, I'm looking at Walton now, um, they were starting the Robin Hood series, which became huge. I think it's one of the first big... It was terrible, but it was very popular. Richard Green was the Robin Hood, who <laughs> was fairly useless. But look at it, I guess he looked good in tights. <laughs> So we made it at Walton Studios, and uh, you know, the set, the same set was like a bit of shrubbery, four trees, which they moved around every week, but moved to a different part of the uh, forest. Quite a good cast of uh, English actors, or most English actors are good anyway. And um, the American lady, Hannah Weinstein, who was the American money, the producer, she uh, had a huge uh, estate down the A3, the Porter's Road. Um, a great big house and so big to crowns. They built the castle in her grounds and you couldn't, it was hidden basically. You know? So <laughs> you obviously did extremely well out of it, you know. So it's a good training. And also during that time, because I think you used to make a whole series of things and you closed down for three months. And ju- during that closed down period, they were bringing what they call B-films, into the studio. So a B-film is like a one-hour, usually black and white film. <laughs> it's total crap. <laughs> um, some has-been American actor would be in it. Sometimes you would. Um, later, somebody like uh, Jewel Draft did one. So you, you've worked with some of the old greats, but most of it was... Um, but once again, it was a good, a good experience, you know. And um, I was very... I was a fast learner, and I, I loved doing it. I couldn't believe how lucky I was, you know. I could have ended up anywhere, and like a lot of my friends did. And then the first major, major thing I worked on was The Night to Remember, the Titanic. And that was the biggest break of my life because Jeffrey Unsworth was the DP, Johnny Alcott was the camera assistant, and I went on as the clapper boy. And that's, that was it. I was suddenly in... The aid leave. I mean, I was with the big boys, you know, and I realised that very quickly. Uh, we did night work at Pine, but we had the Titanic in the back lot there, the angle. Uh, it was all very complicated for me. It was like a whole new adventure, you know. After what, what's what, smart to catch up now? I'm on, <laughs> on the Titanic, thinking. I I was I never had any money. I was you know, so I had no clothes. Everyone there was dressed up in you. Know, not North Face, wasn't it? But great big warm things, duffel coats, stuff like that. And I, I, I borrowed my father's blazer. I thought I should look smart, and I'm freezing my ass off in the coldest winter for years. So I ran everywhere. You know, one of the back, one of what film run, one of the lens run, and of course that stuck in. Then Pine would close almost overnight. They sacked all these camera crews that were there. I was there as a freelance. And Jeff Hunsworth and Johnny Alcott, they all went on to you know, normal films. Well, Jeff was very popular, very good camera, very popular. And he was doing a film called Tamahine, which is not a very good film, with Nancy Kwan, because he'd done The World of Susie Wong. So he was under, Nancy Kwan had him, had Jeff in her contract. And the clapper what they had was really not very good. And Jeffy said, uh, well, that young man that used to run it, you know, let's get him. Well, you know. So I was then reunited with them. And unbelievably lucky, the film 
they'd done about four or five weeks shoot in the studio. And I arrived a few weeks in the studio and then terrible thing, we went to Tahiti on location, Bora Bora, which for 19 year olds is a terrible place to go to, I can assure you. So uh, that was it. That was, that was the end of, well, basically changed my life. I spent I don't know, 25 years then, mostly with Jeff, you know, until I was a camera operator. And then I just started to direct second units. Jeffrey was probably still a director of photography. And Jeff and I's kind of dream with his uh, wife, Maggie Unsworth, who was a um, continuity girl and also a producer, as the three of us, three musketeers, w- would make a film together. And that was, and I would direct. I mean, I, you know, I couldn't believe this. You know? And then Jeffrey really let me down. He died. And uh, over, he was on tests with Polanski, went to his room on a Sunday night, all to the bowl of soup. And when they went, he was, um, he was dead. And that was kind of, it's like, was, it was I'm so sick, but it's worse than losing my father. He was closer to me because I wasn't close to my father. I hardly knew him. But Jeff was like a, not only an inspiration, he was like a, a father figure, someone that's always been there for me because Jeff was like Rex Harrison. He was like quiet English gentleman. And I, of course, I was a, a mouthy little git. So the two of us together worked quite well. And he, he pulled me back when necessary and then sent me in when, when he needed someone to go in and could he never Jeff never questioned anything you know he uh, he just said a photograph so sometimes we work with wonderful people and, and a few times we work with total assholes that's when I was used as like the the, the bathroom round to uh, <laughs> make make the points so it's, it's a lovely a lovely time for me I learnt a lot and um then, of course, Jeffrey died. I was already, uh, by then, directing. I, direct, I just directed my first second unit um, in Africa, Sulu Dawn. Mm. And I, it was huge because I, I was with David Tomlin, who is who I'd known forever, who a wonderful assistant director. And he and I were co-directing, and I was photographing. And we had one time 10,000 Zulu warriors. You know, David was great at organizing. We never had siege, it wasn't multiple things. 10,000, you had 10,000, you didn't have five. And then, how, it, how do you go about directing 10,000 extras like that? I mean, David was a formidable guy, I know that, but well, still, I, it's funny enough. I don't know what I never had any in many ways. I was very insecure until I always had a camera, mm. and then I thought. I had no worries at all, 10,000, 20,000. I mean, I would just tell her what I wanted. Well, yeah, obviously, through interpreters. You know, mm-hmm. They say what I wanted, organise huge battles. I, I thought, oh, this cannot be bad. You're being paid fairly good money in those days, and you're given Zulu warriors to battle against the Redcoats. And the great thing was also, I mean, I much prefer the Zulus because we're in South Africa, so all the white extras were real nasty Afrikaners, I mean, hateful people. And we had quite a few, not bad accents, but actually, because they, they, we had obviously rifles with full blanks in to get the good look. You do it, you shoot the Zulus at 25 feet, but these assholes are waiting until they were six, eight, 10 feet away and shooting them. And of course, they still hurt. They used to cause me, I mean, I had terrible, Rouse and threw as many insults into these assholes as I could. And also with these, the Zulus, who were wonderful, beautiful people, they called David Tomlin the big white elephant because he's big and big and very important and wonderful, wonderful man. And I said, What they call me? And they said, You don't want to know. I said, well, I, don't want to shoot. I said, I'm not going to shoot until I know what they call me. So he, big white elephant, I was a little squeaky mouse. So <laughs> I, I thought, fuck you. Um, <laughs> but a mouse is enough to scare an elephant, right? So, I know, you know. <laughs> by that later, I said, well, <laughs> the old fable. But I say it was wonderful. And, and having someone as experienced as alongside me as David, who had no ego at all, mm. was great, you know. And uh, we had terrible uh, Rhodesian South African producers, you know, who were really crooks. I mean, they were. I mean, it doesn't matter now what I say, but they were, money was disappearing. I mean, all over the place and not onto the screen. You know, and I knew this. I found out things they were doing, and I, I went in to challenge the producer, and he was quite rude. And I, I'm quite small, but 
I tipped over his desk on top of him in temper, because when you were angry, knowing that David was behind me, because the producer is a big guy. Uh, and I looked around and David was not there. I died his producers under his table looking like one of those turtles on their face. <laughs> I pushed the table up. I looked around thinking David any minute now, because David was a big guy, you know, would come in. And David was, I looked like it, he was giggling in the background. He, he was there, but wasn't there. You know? But it, it, uh, it had to decide effect. The producers became more honest and the money became what it should be there for to go onto the screen, you know. And also, I, I found out what they were charging for the Zulus and what they were paying them. So I made sure that the Zulus. Got, they wasn't well paid, but it's like five or ten dollars a day for them. It's like an absolute fortune. Yeah, good for you. And I wouldn't leave at night until the accountant came. And I, David, and I stood there until they were all paid. And we had a kind of beads, you know, kind of bead system. If they did something special, they got a, a red bead or a green bead. Or like, so if they did something special, they get another five dollars. You know, which for them was you know, fortune. You know. Because if we weren't there, I know these beads, first of the Zulus didn't understand what these beads were about. They thought they were to hang around their neck. But it was to make sure they were fairly paid. You know? So, um, But that was, uh, I think, um, a really good experience to start, you know. And mm. I, and I say, I, I know in many ways I'm not that confident for filming. I, I just love it and I won't, you know, I won't say don't take prisoners, but I, I listen to everyone, but I, I will make decisions because I think that's what you're there for I've worked with enough directors yeah you work with some some huge names haven't you I mean you worked with you know it, if I just look at my list here it's a ridiculous number of huge directors I mean it's it's you know if I Paul Greengrass Mike Newell uh, Tim Burton Irving Kirshner Attenborough Richard Donner Richard Lester Bob Fosse I mean it's just it's mind-blowing why are you shouting at but that is that is something in the background. Well, no, Fosse, and Barbara Streisand. And Lumet um, and Foreman and Borman. And I mean, just the, the list goes on. What, what, so around that period, around that period of um, Zulu Dawn, that was late 70s, right? That would have been a particularly busy period for you, I guess, because you had, what, Lucky Lady would have been, what, 75? And then Bridge Too Far, 76, 77. Then The Empire Strikes Back. How did you get involved in that? Was that... What was the connection? Yeah. That, that came from one of the... Uh, well, David Tomlin was the first assistant on it. So I should imagine David put my name forward. Um, and Kirshner was a sweetheart. You know, I met... And it's more or less, you know, get on with it. You know, he's one of those that... Um, like someone else, another director, said, I said, I don't care, Peter. You do the work, I get the acclaim. <laughs> I, it wasn't the last thing. It was like, whereas other directors, don't you dare do this and do it without checking with me and don't you get on with it. I mean, some, I worked with one idiot that said, and I had big sequences of the film, he said, uh, and you must never talk to the actors. So I said, well, how can I work? You know, well, you do it through me. I said, but I've been, I said, how to the basketball? He went, I said, I'm in Dartmoor and you're in Shepparton. How are we going to make this work, you prick? I said, <laughs> <laughs> I've always got on well for with actors, even the nasty ones. I've always got on well with actors. I treat them with respect, but not with kind of, oh, my God, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they're there to do a job like we all are, you know, and the only thing that's different about them, they're normally amazingly well paid for it. Yeah. We, certainly, we certainly weren't in those days. You know, I remember working with um, lovely James Cagney on Ragtime, you know, and he said, you know, he was just so honest. He said... Uh, no, but I did an interview with him you know, sort of between different things, different. Well, I was shooting a second unit and directed him, but also they wanted some publicity and I interviewed him. And mm. he was the most honest man. He said, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, he said, I'm no more important than the carpenter there or the plasterer there. He said, we're all part of a team. He said, I'm very lucky. I get very well paid and they probably don't, you know. And he was, he was one of the most joyous men I've ever met in my life. I just... Um, and when I look back, I, every time I see, I watched uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy the other night when, when he does that dance. I mean, the dance, stiff leg dance. And they, Donald O'Connor was on this film, was a very great dancer, Donald O'Connor. And he said the, the, the dance that uh, Cagney did in that, the stiff leg kind of Irish dance, he said that's the hardest 
a most physical thing to do. He said it really is. So to make it look good like he did. And so, so that was, I mean, I consider myself, I, mean, I still pinch myself sometimes thinking yeah, I what could have happened and what did happen and how lucky. When I hear, not now because I, I hardly ever go to shoot but a few years ago, I hear, you know, Clapper boys, we know, oh, we're not getting, you know, not, not paying the right money. I think to myself, you are so You don't know how lucky you are in a job like this. You are being well paid. You're getting the same money as a surgeon, mm-hmm. you know, like a thousand pound a week for someone to clap a ball together. Hello. I'm still moaning. I think, I, I, luckily, all my, the crews I had were never, ever like that. You know, we all loved what we did and got privileged, you know, but sometimes when you're just going in for, in a short time, especially at the end of my career, you know, we was going for a few weeks to clear up things, you know, and you hear this moaning and groaning, and that's, I really hated it. You know. It's about taking the opportunities as well, isn't it, that present themselves um, in those situations. You know, it's not just about the pay you're getting on that day, it's about where you could end up and, and creating relationships with people that move you on to the next job. Oh, yeah, I mean, it, I tell you, I consider myself amazingly lucky, you know, really, and uh, you've taken to exotic, I mean, you go to Tahiti, and those at first class, you're a clapper boy, you're taken to Tahiti, first class, hello, but that was union rules then. <laughs> you, I did like three films with Laurence Olivier, mm. you uh, Guinness, I mean, to work with it, and then you, <laughs> the other end, you work with Jean-Claude Van Damme, and you, <laughs> yeah. pay, you pay your dues. <laughs> but yeah, working with Alec Guinness is one of, one of the highlights of my life. What John, film was that? And that was on, on Cromwell. He played King Charles. And I'll tell you a quick story. So we're in, shooting in Spain. We had all the Spanish cavalry. We had a huge about 800 horsemen. And we did have, it wasn't CG. And Alec was a king. And he wasn't a great horseman, Alec. And, and he had to play to, with a slight stutter that Charles had. Mm. And he looked on the horseback, he, looked, he was the king. I mean, he almost went up to him and you, you bowed. And we had this huge shot to do, lasting at night in Spain. And I know we'd only get one go at it, you know, one chance. The director was a bit wishy-washy. And I said to him, it's very important, because you know, I'm on the crane and the first thing you see is the king come over. And then as you crane up, then behind him are 300 horsemen, you know. And I knew it was one chance, no. <laughs> he said, Well, I, I, I won't talk to him. So I went to up to Alec. And I said, uh, He's on his horse. I'm looking at it. Excuse me, Alec. You know, you've got, you've got a world with him. He's a lovely man. Mm. I said, I never do this. I said, you know, But it's a one off chance, this shot, you know. And uh, it's vital when you come up. I said, I've got this big mark on the floor. Look, and that's where you land. So as I crane up, I see the. Uh, Cavalry behind you, and he looks at me. First king said, "Don't tell me, dear boy. Tell a fucking horse." <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and I thought it was so lovely. And then, then he winked, of course, and of course he hit the mark. You know, because he, <laughs> that's great. He's lovely. I mean, the difference between him and say um, Oliver Reed or Richard Woodmark or people like that it can be can be obnoxious. Whereas, it, especially those old English actors, are all been through the mill. On stage, lots of them, most of them have done stage work, which I always find make makes them totally disciplined, you know. And also appreciates that you have problems, you know. I mean, I've worked with American actors, and you say, oh, by the way, da da da. And I say, just don't tell me, just keep me in picture. That's why you say, even if you go upset, you know, I mean, there's, there's some, <laughs> some arrogant ones, you know. Whereas I, most of the English ones and the good American ones, especially the other day, they understand it's a team. A team effort, which of course it is. But I mean, I think were my my operating days were my, I guess my happiest days. To be quite honest, I loved the job. I loved the relationships you could have with directors. And although you were responsible, you weren't as responsible. Once you start directing for for you know you are the sleep at night is sometimes very hard, and very often you do a twelve hour day. Mm-hmm. Go to the office, whoa. And then the producers are ambushing you to tell you this was, you know, this you took too long here. Tomorrow got to pick up, you know. Instead of thinking that's really good stuff, you know. I mean, not all, but some are like that. You know, it's, uh, it made you very angry. That's why I'm so lucky 
all the years with David, because Tomlin would see if I was getting pissed off, and I suddenly find I was moving without knowing. He grabbed hold of my back of my shirt and said, "Pull me out, pull me out the trailer, trailer," and said, "Stop it, just calm down." And because uh, because no one would, David was one of those people no one would ever challenge, you know. Because if you if you, I mean, I've never seen David hit or get it aggressive, but you knew that if he did, you yeah. probably get up for a very long time, you know. Was yeah, it? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I've I've worked with TV directors who shout all day long, and everyone just loses dis- loses respect for them and doesn't want to work for them again. But then you have those directors who you know could shout, and if they did shout, then it will mean something, and in and it has an impact. And I'm sure, yeah, from what you're saying, David sort of fills that category. I think the only time I used to get angry is if people showed disrespect, whether it's an actor or a crew. You know, I I wouldn't. Accept, I mean, I work with some actors that were really quite nasty and I would always take them aside and say you know, when you're on my set we don't have that if you have a problem you tell me and if you think the grip's doing something wrong or the camera's it I said I will work it out I don't need mm. you shouting and screaming you know and uh, especially in America you know because because once one person starts shouting one does because you can't be hurt you know and, and that, that I hate you know yeah I don't, I've often wondered if that's like a a strange mixture of arrogance and insecurity, sort of, you know. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. The insecurity. Mm. Total insecurity, you know. I mean, the great directors, I'm sure they get angry, but it's a little whippersnappers that shout and scream. And, uh, you know, I've heard them. I was flying with one in the helicopter. We were doing a, quite a complex shot. And I was a cameraman, and he, this director was in the front screaming at the pilot. No, I don't. And I said, you know, basically shut the fuck up, you know. Because mm. if you unnerve the pilot yeah, and he we're made, all dead. <laughs> it you, I said, forget the film, we'll all be dead, you know. Yeah. You can't talk to me that way. I said, well, I fucking, yeah. Because you know, here we have, because they're not talking, just screaming at each other. <laughs> and uh, he said, we'll sort this out when we get down. I said, whatever you want. I said, but if we're going to make this film, you are not going to scream at people, you know. And, uh, yeah. And he, when he landed, he did, um, he kind of sussed out that maybe he'd, uh, and he also, he was, he, was, he was useless as well. That's the other thing, you know, he was a useless. George Pan Cosmatus, was used dead, so I can say what I want. But he, <laughs> he was fucking useless, you know. And he got so confused, he sometimes had three cigarettes in his mouth, forgetting, he, he lit one, put it in his mouth, it hanging out, then another one, and he couldn't work out what to do with the third one. <laughs> So this is the man put in charge of directing. Oh, don't ask me how these things happen, how they get in charge of a film. I'll never know. I, it does strike me sometimes that people like yourself are almost, it's almost like you're punished for being so good at what you do that it allows other people to slot in above, you know? Yeah, it's, it's what pun, well, punished is right, but it, yeah, I guess a lot of people like myself and Tom Lynn and I can name many other mm. Don't, you don't sell yourself. Mm. It's, this sounds a bit silly now, but I mean, as I said before, you feel privileged. I mm. feel privileged when I think of my lack of education, where I came from, and suddenly I'm on traveling the world, and then later on given huge, huge responsibility and quite a bit of respect. I think every day, I think when I was working, I think, how good is this, you know? When you, you know, get out the car at the, at the location or studio, and you see all these two, three hundred people all looking around at you, what are we going to do? You know, I, I mean, I must admit, times it's quite you panic a bit because yeah. you don't know, you know. But it's a, it's a no. It, I I just feel so lucky to have had that decades and decades of that. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there could well have been a situation if you'd not had that personality that you would have had, you know, not even half the career that you've had because people go into these industries, don't they, and they burn out and they have their sort of their one chance and off they go again and they're never seen again. Yes, I mean, I, yeah, you're great because I've worked with directors and think who weren't very good. And they last day shooting, we all say goodbye. I, I never never heard about it. You never hear it. <laughs> I don't know whether they go outside. I know when I used to work for Caralco, which was kind of quite a mafioso uh, thing, and the, one of the producers, um, they had trouble with the editor. And we're watching rushes and Sly shouting at things because the editing wasn't right, and 
I was sitting next to this big producer who was, who was an ex enforcer for Mafia. And uh, the lights went up, and the editor, I looked around, the editors weren't there anymore. And I said, Where are the editors? Don't worry, Peter, they're history. So I said, Now, when you say that, are you talking in your mafioso way? Or <laughs> is this, is this <laughs> their history? I never did see them again. So whether they're floating around in the Dead Sea somewhere, I have no idea. But they along, were. along with all those directors that only had one picture, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you know, as I said, you worked on with some some very big directors, but also you know with them on some some very big movies. I mean, Superman really kind of marks the point of the first superhero movie in many ways, and it's still looked back on very very fondly. What was Richard Donner like to work for? Because obviously, you shot one and two back to back, right? Yeah, we did, didn't finish the whole of two, but we shot most of it. But then Dick Lester took over. Uh, that was that was all the way that was handled by the Soul Kinds was disgusting. I can't imagine anyone else but Donna directing Superman. He was perfect because he's a big child. He's very talented. But he's a big kid in many ways. Lovely, lovely person. Never, I never heard him say anything or in a way harmful to people. Um, it was fun to work. We gave you a lot of leeway, appreciated it. Mm -hmm. I was rush, as you say. That shot wasn't my idea. That was the kid's idea, you know. I oh, hope really? it works, Peter. I didn't want to do it. He'd just gag away, you know. And you sit there thinking, it did nothing really. I hope it did work or it does work. You know? And he had a hard time from the soul kind, so they weren't. Uh, and there was talk about replacing him with Dick Lester. So they bought Dick Lester because he Dick had done the three musketeers for the soul guys. And I knew Dick, I worked with him. And and uh, Dick came in and I found out because at the first day he got a million dollars, which in those days is not bad now. But uh, because that's what they owed him from musketeers, they they reneged on what they said they pay him. So he took over, didn't take over, he came on to Superman as producer. Would you understand it? As he walked on the floor the first day, zoom, a check for a million has come into his hand, you know. And Donna was quite worried, you know, because he thought that, that part of his career had he been sacked, that would have almost could have been the end of he'd had to go back to TV. It wouldn't, you'd never have another feature film. And I just say to, to Donna, I said, I don't think you need to worry. I said, knowing Dick Lesser, I said, he won't want this is such a complex film. This first time flying had been really and Dick Lesser didn't have any patience at all. He was a fun person to work with, even more fun to go out socially. But patience, he could never have done it. And I said this to Don, I said, you know, I think you're safe, you know. I said, use him as a friend, use him as an ally, you know. And Lester was, you know, Lester, although he did took over later when, the, <clears throat> when they were editing and we had to hold of the first one, half the second one. And then the soul comes to Donna didn't even know that he wasn't going to be invited back because it all closed down while they edited because they had to get the one out to get some money to finish two. And he kind of bumped into someone maybe in LA agent and said, oh, I'm really sorry, Dick, what's happened to you? And he said, well, what's happened to you? He didn't know that he was being replaced, you know, which is disgusting. I mean, it's a... And I say, as I said earlier, I can't think of anyone else that I've ever worked with that could have done such a good job because he, he was he was fun. He understood exactly what the American audience wanted, which I don't think Dick Lester or any English director would have understood because we we never did that kind of comic books. We do now, but then comic book was kind of a little bit unknown to us. I know you. Yeah, but, you know, you could have trouble with some of the actors, but you know, he was—he used to kind of jolly them through. You know, he so never confrontational. But um, and also, it's Chris, Chris's first major film, and Chris was lovely, but very, very serious. He took it, he took it all very serious, and Dick was always trying to lighten him up a bit, you know. And um, I remember we were in New York shooting, and I was up on a camera crane. Um, had uh, Chris next to me, you know, dressed up Superman with the wires, and we waited for the, the theatre crowds who just turned out, so we have to wait for them to all go, and then we're going to do a big flying shot. 
And we got on very well. We were chatting away out there. And then the theater opened up, all 500 people came out, Americans, obviously. And one looked up and said, God, it's Superman. And it was just like the comic books. They all looked up, my God, it's as if it was really Superman. And he, <laughs> he'd come there to um, save New York, you know. Yeah. Uh, I looked at Chris, I said, you should be sad. You're home and dry now. I said, that's that's what the audience, that is the audience, you that's know. That's brilliant. A lot of it's younger. If only you had, had the cameras rolling on them. <laughs> yeah, but I, I said, but it's a theatre crowd, it's just from yeah. Sydney or something. So saying that, you can imagine what the youngsters are going to say, you know. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, they, I, I've seen some of the behind the scenes stuff, you know, with you there and Richard Donner there and obviously the, the cast. They, it looked like there was quite a lot of energy going on uh, there, like Margot Kidder and Christopher. And, you know, Gene Hackman's a bit of a force of nature as well, isn't he? Yeah, I did three, three, three pills with Gene. Um, yes, he's a... I like him a lot. I mean, first, he's a superb mm. actor. Um, he's a bit of a bully. So you've got to stand up to him. When we did Lucky Lady in Mexico with he and uh, Burt Reynolds, I mean, they were... Up. But I must say, whereas... Uh, what's that? Stanley Donahue's to power over I used to stand up and we got on very well because you I got a lovely photograph of the three of us the two actors myself in a little dinghy in the middle of the Sea of Cortez <laughs> and there'd been a big argument because he Bert Ross been shouting at one of the crew on the other boat who was a friend of mine and we had a row about it you know and there's three of us in this boat bobbing around in the middle of the Pacific and uh I, without realise, I crawled closer and closer. As I get angry, closer and closer to uh, Reynolds. And next thing I know, I was in the air. And Gene had picked me up, a good strong man. He kind of picked me up, put me back in my place. He said, "You made your point, Peter." <laughs> <laughs> but for a moment, I thought I was levitating. <laughs> no, no. So there are lots of lots of wonderful experiences that you have. And then, well, I'm just thinking as well, like, you know, we touched on The Empire Strikes Back. I think what a lot of people don't realise is that you, um, you know, you directed, didn't you, the majority of the, the scenes in Fincer? Yes, we did. And I think the first unit came out for, only for a few days and then shot stuff with uh, Harrison. And then they left, which was great, you know. I think it instigated a lot by David Tomlin, who realised that my crew would work much quicker, could be a smaller, lighter than the first unit. So we'd have to do stuff with, with the actors and with the action. And it was, um, I enjoyed it, I must say, it was very, 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 very tough because it's 40 below. And I don't know if you've experienced that type of cold, but it is. I, I stand there one day and I look in around at the crew and I said to I had a Norwegian production manager, wonderful guy. And I said to him, I only want to hear from you if the, if the storm's coming or the weather. I don't want to hear everyone say, no, I just looked at my bunions and I think it's, you tell me to rap when we rap, you know. And I looked at the crew and I said to him, I said, oh, crew are working slow today. I'm going to have, a, to have to chat with them because I knew there was quite a bit of nightlife. And I know we're in the middle of nowhere. They, they, they had a distillery they made up. And uh, he said, Peter, it's hypothermia. They're not walking, say, I'll freeze him. And they, everyone was kind of going like that. So I, I said, we should wrap. He said, we, we are going to, we are definitely going to wrap. You know? And it was funny. I thought they all looked like they were slightly slow motion. And I could take, get them all together that night and say, maybe we've got to cut down on the drinking boys you know, and have a little, make that the weekend, but not every single night. They wouldn't have listened to me, but that's why I say that. But anyway, that was, uh, but the crew, I mean, it's a, uh, when you think of the film, so you, you could be one film in a, you know, in a desert, a Sahara Desert, which I've been another time in a rainforest or a jungle, then 40 below, uh, so it's or middle of New York or wherever. So it's a wonderful, um, it, everything's almost every film is a different experience and a, and a different learning curve, you know. And you can't necessarily um, sort of prepare for those situations. I mean, you know, being 40 below, there's not much you can do as a person other than try and wrap up as warm as possible. But what about the equipment and in these in these environments? I mean, 
did the film snap and things like that? Yeah, we had, um, well, first before we went, because I experienced cold before, but not quite as bad as this. And we were at uh, Elstree Studios, and just at the road where the old MGM Studios was, was a, a deep huge, what the stage they was, which was marvellous films there. It was now a deep freeze, huge deep freeze. So I thought, that's what we do. So after I came back from the location, recce, not shooting, and experienced what it's like, I got, the, quite cruelly, I got the crew, camera crews, ADs, standbys, in the outfit they were going to wear, which we've got special outfits, you know, and the cameras and all that, and put them in the deep freeze and knocked them, knocked them there, put them at about nine o'clock and let them out at um, lunchtime. And I couldn't stop laughing because as you opened the door, you looked like you got kind of, they'd all got this white haze of frozen breath and so the ones with beers like yours were full of ice. The camera was like an icicle. And they, they, he looked at me and said, what the? I said, well, now you know, you know, what it's going to be. And it wasn't ever quite as bad as that, but it made everyone understand what the equipment and we had um, George Lucas's um, camera, which was an old Technicolor camera that had been made into a uh, 70 mil camera. So this camera is the oldest thing on the feet. It's older than any of us. It's, it's Technicolor you know, from the 30s. You know. Great big thing. Never, ever failed us. This great, great big machine. He had, we had his own heat, heating pad and his own generator. Never failed us. It worked on every single shot. Some of the other stuff we had, we had Americans came over with this new high tech seventy mil camera. Uh, they were nice guys, but they were very flash, and they arrived about halfway through a shoot. They said they looked at his Technic camera camera. Uh, so I said, Jesus Christ! And they got their camera out, and they said, "This is a future, Peter. Got you fifty years out of date." And I said, "Okay." So what do you want us to do? I said, I'd like you to go out. This was like six o'clock at night. I said, I'd like you to take your camera outside then now and leave it outside all night. You know, you plug it into your heating system, whatever, but just leave it out for the next eight hours. They said, what do you mean in the cold? I said, well, yes, in the cold. But now, I said, well, yeah. Anyway, they did, of course. They went in the morning well, after we chipped the ice off this camera. I don't, we didn't get a shot, I don't think, ever from this, because it was a high highly technical camera. It just didn't, well, it just wouldn't. Whereas this lovely old camera churned it out. And one day we got hit by a, a blizzard that came out of nowhere, because normally we were warned. And suddenly just, and we're in quite a dangerous place. And the Norwegian guy said, Peter, we're out of here. Just have to leave everything. We've got to go now. That is coming in fast. And I said, what? He said, everything. So I said, I always obey you. So we've got all the crew in the vehicles, got halfway down towards the hotel and by then we couldn't see anything and my assistant Mike Brewster was a kind of looked at a macho guy he had to get out and he, he led us he led all the snow cats down you know because you couldn't see and he and the following day we went out this wilderness everything had changed and I'm looking around I'm rehearsing what I could call George Lucas and say you know that camera that you loved that Technicolor camera you are converting, that you adored, you're almost married to. It's no more. And we went to roughly where we said, because I don't know if you've been in snow, but you couldn't tell where you've been. Or, and we're looking around, I said, oh, shit. And suddenly, I think it was Bruce, so he said, shh, be quiet. I said, wait a minute, I'm a director, I can talk to be quiet. And, went, shh, shh. and we heard a little pop, pop, pop noise. And it had a little motor, a heating, a little Honda generator with it to heat its uh, blanket. And that was like two foot under the snow, but still, work. I mean, what an advert for Honda. It's still working. <laughs> we got the camera up. We got the camera up and good as gold. It was, uh, it, it worked straight away. And uh, I didn't have to phone up George. <laughs> Moment of relief. Well, we're about halfway through my chat with Peter McDonald. We'll be back after these short messages. Hi, my name is Helen O'Hara and I'm a film journalist and author of the new book Women vs. Hollywood, The Fall and Rise of Women in Film. It's a quick trip through 125 years of film history and the ways that women succeeded in shaping it and were forced out of the top jobs. 
from silent era directors to Me Too and Time's Up. It's a good starting point to learn more about the people written out of Hollywood's history. And it's available now in all good bookshops, virtual and physical. Hope you like it. Cheers. Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth podcast. The Projection Booth is single-handedly the greatest film podcast you could ever listen to or could possibly want. Top notch. Five stars. This has quickly become one of my favorite film-related podcasts. Always interesting. A completely unpretentious yet fully comprehensive look at films from all genres. The Projection Booth podcast with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. Are you tired of pop culture podcasts where the hosts exist in a constant, blissful state of agreement? Well, fear not. Let me introduce you to the Chinstroker vs. Punter podcast. Mike is an ex-film student with a penchant for David Lynch, and Paul is your man on the street who likes what he knows and knows what he likes. Join us fortnightly as we discuss what we've been watching from our own very different perspectives. You can find us at csvsp.libson.com. Chinstroker vs. Punter is a proud member of the Pod Syndicate family of podcasts. And now back to my chat with director Peter McDonald. Being camera operator and second unit uh, director, what if just so people that aren't aware of what a second unit director does, how do you define that? Is there are there parameters into which you can define it? The thing I always felt is no one should tell the difference between your work as second unit and the first unit, as, and if you work with a a good director, that was great because you, you could really do your very best work. One or two times, not that many, I work with very average directors. And if your work came up and shined too much, then you're really going to upset. I mean, you didn't do bad work, but you didn't go that little step forward. I mean, I remember when we did Cry Freedom in Zimbabwe and uh, Kind of rushes that night, and the Denzel Washington was there. I said, well, You never come to rushes, and you sit down. Mm. And <laughs> Dickie's there over. He said, I oh, know, we haven't come to see Dickie's stuff, we come to see your stuff. We hear it's very good. I said, thank you very much. I was just about in my career, gentlemen. <laughs> but, uh, they were joking, but Dickie, oh, I knew very well, Carl. Didn't really that. Because, uh, see, I mean, the good thing about second unit, you have less. You don't have the terrible pressure, which we've all had, you know, when you do the first unit you know, with money and producers, you, know, you can get away with more. And as I think I said earlier, you you, you get the good stuff to do. You get the exciting stuff to do. You know, you get the 5,000 Zulus or the helicopters through the canyon. So that's what you do, you know. So that uh, is quite hard to fuck it up. Mind you, a few people I worried have, but, I mean, you do... Especially when we did think, Rambo 2 in Mexico with George Pan's called George Pan Cosmatas, you know. And uh, he got angry because not only did I put you know, my helicopter stuff up, which was very good, I had great pilots. I got the editor to put great drive in rock and roll music over it. Amazing. The difference it makes the scene silent to something. Like and it's really used to piss off George, you say. Why Peter got music? I haven't. They said, well, you've got dialogue. You know, you've got your recording, the actors talking. Peter's doing, yeah, I want music as well. <laughs> you can't have it. That comes on later, George. Because no, George was, a, that's later, George. And uh, I remember David Tomlin, who was the assistant director, luckily for George, he said, if I write my book, George, I'm going to say, say action, George, because George was standing there beginning to shot, not knowing why it was things. And, and, you have to say action, George. You action, yeah. Because uh, David, I mean, to be quite honest, uh, David on many films actually made the film. You know, never got the claim. He had directed his own stuff and written his own stuff for TV stuff. But um, you know, behind the scenes, he he used to give, arrive for work in the morning and he give George a piece of paper, which David and I would talk about that night. You know. How to split the work the following day because I say David and I had an incredible relationship. So following morning, Georgia could out the car looking confused, two or three cigarettes hanging with his mouth, saying, This is your day's work, George. Quietly, never in fact, it's your day's work. And, to, oh, yeah. and then George would go around the corner to the toilet 
and copy David's list, which we typed out in his own handwriting, and then type, and then come back and say, oh, "What we do now? Uh, we do this, and we do that." <laughs> just know, I you, I asked one. I said, "David, why do you, you know? Don't you get angry?" He said, "The important thing is, we, you know, we shoot, we finish shooting." But I remember one day George was very insulting and to David, which was very silly because David the last person for many reasons. And David kind of looked at him and I could see the anger. You know, and I knew David very well. I thought, how could he's going to hit him? And what David did, he just tore up the uh, paper with all the shot lists on and threw it in the bin. And George said, where's my list? He said, uh, it's there in about 300 pieces now, George. What are we going to do, George? I just, what do you mean? He said, well, what are we going to do? And of course, I said, George totally panicked. I said, what do you have to, what, you have to tell me what's going I said, well, and this guy, even in those days, was getting a million dollars for the film. I didn't get another two of films. Of course, you live on, you have to make like, two really bad things. So you're getting a million dollars for another two or three films. But it's all been done for you, you know. But, um, no, uh, yeah, there's people like that. Uh, yeah. There's several ADs like that that um, never ever got the acclaim. You know, Burt Bax, another one who never got the acclaim that um, or people didn't realise without them, you know, the director was floundering. I and mean, you never mind helping, you know, because some directors are good technically, some are good with actors, some are always thinking how they're going to edit, you know. And one or two are just not thinking, you know, and are very lucky to have got in that position, yeah. which is okay as long as they're not arrogant. But when they're like that, needing help and they're arrogant, then it does it used to make me very angry. So how did the directing gig uh, for Rambo 3 come about then for you? Um, because um, Russell, okay, Russell, I met Russell because I had been done Rambo 2. I really wasn't going to do any more Rambo. That was enough for me. And I met, I had a meeting with Russell. He said, could, could we talk? I said, well, yeah, we could talk. I said, but I'm really, I've had enough of that Coralco company and the way they run. And also I'm fed up like in helicopters. Anyway, I took about an hour with her. And he was one, most, one of the most charming men you can meet. Very creative. Very, very kind of gay, creative, fun. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh, yeah, you know, so, cool. I knew I'd get up with him, but I, I was thinking, how would you survive with this group? You know, how, I, was, I didn't say that. I said uh, outwardly, I just say, you know, you know, you, these are a very tough bunch of guys you're going to, you know, work with. You won't necessarily get the kind of coverage and help that you'd maybe expect, you know. Anyway, she said, oh, no, no, I got them very affordable. I said, well, great. So anyway, I had a huge amount to shoot on the film and a uh, lot of night work, helicopter stuff, and uh, and also I knew I was going to end up with a lot of the actors. And I went to see Russell one night, and I could see, you could almost feel the, the vibes there. And then suddenly people were being sacked. The two camera crews were sacked. Cameraman was sacked, ADs were sacked, and it, it was almost like it's creeping closer and closer to Russell. So when they sacked the American DP, Rick Waits, I think his name was, and the ADs, I took over photographing the first unit for a little while, and Terry Needham, my AD, came with me. And you know, we were a good team and very organized. So I said to Russell, you know, in the background, there's not a lot of shit going, oh, no, no, no. I said, well, there is, you know. So I said, uh, if you trust Terry and I, just hang on to our shirt tails so the next couple of nights and we're going to get you back on schedule. But we can't have, oh, what about doing this? You know, it's really got to be. And we did. And we shot for about five days with, with and we got him not only back on schedule, but kind of a day in hand, you know. Meanwhile, people are still being sacked all over the place. And then they walked in, because I was, I said, I'm not going to do more than a week. Either you get rid of me or I go back to what I was here for, which is directing a second unit. 
Anyway, the, uh, about a week, maybe not even a week later, uh, I went to see Russell and I was warned by the, basically, all his history has gone. He's, uh, they just sacked him. End of the day, shoot, night shooting. And he said, you know, there's your car. We've already packed your case. There's a ticket at the airport. That way. I mean, really, that strong, you know. He was devastated. He was a really nice guy, you know. And, uh, I thought, my God, you know. I said, well, what's going to happen? They said, you're taking over. I said, don't you think you should, we should talk about this? No. Oh, the money. I said, not, not talk it. I should have done. No, not about the money. I was a bit stupid there because I sort of said, yes, I will do for X amount. Um, it was a whole way. They said, well, the other, if either you, you take over or we close down for a week or two weeks, which costs a fortune, we get an American director over with and we get a completely new crew properly with that. You know, which meant all the people, a lot of people there were friends of mine, mates of mine for a year. So it means everyone would be, or the majority would be sacked, you know. So I said, well, let me think about this. And I walked around the back lot of the world, cars were parked and came back. I said, well, can I have an agreement? And they said, what's well, that? And Sly was there. I said, yeah. I think we should have a little think about a rewrite. And also, I feel that the film lacks, you're never vulnerable. I said, no, you're totally, it doesn't matter what you get into, everyone's just, ah, he's, not, he's in no danger at all. And I said, a little bit of humour doesn't go amiss, you know. And, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll go along with that. I think sort of 12, up to 12 o'clock the first day I took over, I got vulnerability and humour after lunch. <laughs> this guy's hey, Sly, look like a fucking poop, you know. Of course, after that, when Sly did a few other films like that, he he did put humour into his performance. And I said to him, no, at this sort of point, when Glasnost was happening, I said, I don't suppose any of you look at the news or read the papers, but... If you did, you see that they're all shaking hands. Egan and Gorbachev, we're all mates now. We're, and they you know we spend killing Russians and we're actually now supposed to be friends, you know. So it was a, definitely a film that was should have been made like two years earlier or even not made at all. But for me, it was, um, I told to myself at the end of that, I said, well, this is the old thing. If, you, if I can survive that, then. I probably could find almost anything, you know, which was, you know, because uh, you were very much on your own, you know. But I'd say luckily I had quite a few of my own friends and mates on it. You know. So how much do you think of that, that film, the, the final cut, was was your shots as opposed to...? Oh, a huge, huge amount, yes. I mean, someone worked, I come of someone worked out, I think even on number two, someone said they watched, for, I think, one of my... AD, so funny, very studious man, he said, do you realise that over 50% is our work, you know? And, uh, and also with number three, a huge amount of it was uh, what I'd shot and either when I took over or I think Russell maybe did like two, three weeks of the most, you know, on number three, you know? And... Uh, I, think he, I thought his ideas were good. I mean, he, but he, uh, I don't know. There was, there's a, a, a terrible macho, which I hate anyway, a sort of macho attitude, especially from, not so much from Sly, but from some of his group, you know, were, had nothing to do but cause trouble, which they did quite well, you know, because of what they're going to do, they sit around acting, they're basically kind of, Stunt guys, you know, so they're like sitting around and being silly and putting fires under if someone's canvas seats to set fire to their arse and all that type of thing. And uh, fairly childish, but every now and again, think they've got to say something, you know. Hey, Sly, you look like kind of poof today. I don't think you should really watch this, you know. And, uh, and you know, on this dodgy, in those days, a dodgy old um, black and white video screens where you should you watch the replays and not now when you have really high definition because the black and white used to 
tear the high. So if you had a highlight on like a muscle, because the TV was so bad, it was kind of stretched in a strange shape. And I said, well, that's not the way. That's the TV. That's the system. Your muscle is exactly the same as I'm seeing now. It's not like that. But these idiots used to watch it and go, hey, Sly, look at this. And caused, huge, caused me huge problems. And, um, and also, I mean, because you, sometimes you moved on and they, and they come and persuade Sly that we should move back to that set again. Of course, the producers are never going to go to Sly or these guys, you know, say anything. Kind of, so. so you go back and shoot. So we didn't go vastly over schedule or whatever. So it meant I could never could quite do the type of coverage that I would have liked to do because I had to, you know, I mean, I'm very, uh, I know you can't, I mean, some directors don't care two shits about schedules and budgets, you know, but I've always been brought up, you know, you should try as much as possible to, you know, keep keep it going on as for the money you have, which is normally quite good money, you know, to make those type of films, you know, not this indulgence that, don't worry, we do it again and again, you know, or the thing now, they say, well, we're fixing in post, which we couldn't do then, but that's the day thing, which I really, instead of doing it properly, I don't worry, we can spend another 100,000 fixies in post, which I, I hated, I hated that um, attitude, you know, but uh, I, maybe I'm a bit old fashioned. <laughs> For all the things you can say about um, Rambo 3, though, it does look great. It's still, I mean, that the, you know, the, the, the quality of the image is oh, fantastic yes, on that Blu ray transfer. It's gorgeous. It looks stunning, and you know those those scenes with the fight and the also in the caves as well. It looks fantastic. Yeah, yeah well, I was lucky because I, you know, my background was always camera. I, I influenced a lot about the look, you know, and if because uh, we had several different cameramen all over, you know, they they came away quite regularly. So, you know, and I, I could look immediately and know whether I liked or not. And I knew, I mean, I I knew exactly how to. Photograph slide, you know, the side of me bring up and the cave, you know, the first one I walked in the cave, which was a huge cave, you know, it was used during a crusade. So, so all the crusaders, they, they have, if they had to hide from the enemy, they, they, they get four or five hundred forces in these great big guys, huge. And just has one big open at the top where you could have a huge light coming through. And the first time I, we went on there, and I had to go off somewhere and I came back and I can't remember which cameraman it was. <laughs> I stopped I stopped learning their names at one point. Um, and it was all over lit, you know. There's not every wall was <laughs> I said this is supposed to be a mystery. Just, you know, what's around that corner? I don't want to see what I just want to know there's a corner there then. So um I had to um be quite strong about um the look of it, you know. And I think, you know, yes, you're right. It, it had a good look, and it was you know, the locations were were great as well, you know. And uh, mm. you, you you talked about you know traveling all over the place with the job. Where did you end up with um, Lucas on the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles? Where was that shot? Kenya, Kenya. Yeah, we had a railway line in um, Kenya, which was, as I said, this is almost unused. And I said that word almost worries me slightly because we had a locomotive stuck in a tunnel and actually and I said, well, it was a timetable. I said, this is Kenya, they don't have timetables. So I said, what do we have? He said, well, we've someone like three miles down the track there, you know, with good ears and if they hear a train coming, we'd be warned. Anyway, it wasn't quite that bad, but I thought the word almost is almost yours. Yes, I was like being almost pregnant, um, but that was it was, good, it was good locations, and they and that, that whole setup that look they really uh, they were really wanted everything to be as, as perfect as possible. Got locations, not that were convenient, but what that worked, you know. And uh, it was a good, really good experience, you know. And uh, I I was very impressed with the way they worked, you know. So, and I say whatever you needed, you got, you know. And, and also, happy. I thought the results were great as well. You know, I went to um, George's in the L in San Francisco and edited there. You know, and uh, and I remember I did one huge scene on the beach with the trenches and the all the heroes on horseback and trying to get through the trenches and being shot at all that time. Laid a long track and explosions everywhere. George, all I really want is just one wide shot. 
Perhaps, what is this one white or up and maybe a rostrum here? Because in the sea, they've got little battleships, you know, CG battle. And I said, well, what, what about all the excitement? He said, okay, well, he's... anyway, when I got to the Edison and they, I came, I was really looking forward to the sequence because I knew stuff in it and up come the sequence and it's one fucking wide shot and I said what the? he said well uh, he said it, it sees everything I said yeah but you don't feel it so, anyway very good he said well I spent about half the day re-editing with the editor and that's the way it stayed you know I see what George was saying but you're making it for a young audience you're not making it for some connoisseur of films oh my god the way that just played in one wide shot oh my god it reminded me of this or the other so, um, and I must say, George was good to work with. And also, you got amazing. I mean, I've never had a support like you. You got everything. You you were spoiled, you know, because uh, whatever was needed was there. You know, it wasn't questioned. Well, it's very often, even on Harry Potter films like that, which have lots of money, you very often fight your corner to get extra this or extra that or a crane you need. You, know, you know, you get it, but you which always annoys me because you use a lot of energy fighting for something and then you've got to work 10 or 12 hours a day and that energy, has been, as far as I'm concerned, has been wasted, you know. Mm, mm. Yeah, that, that Young Indiana Jones series was a kind of template, I guess, for George Lucas for what was to come in the future with the way, you know, CG was used and all that kind of stuff. And you mentioned yeah. Harry Potter there. You worked on a, a bunch of the Harry Potters. What, what was that experience like? It's quite funny because I was... Um, I had a call to go in and take over the second unit after they'd been shooting four or five weeks on Harry Potter. And I didn't know. Harry Potter meant nothing to me at all. And also I'd been offered at the time a, a bunch of commercials to direct in South Africa, only about two weeks or one week's work, but it was going to be well paid, you know. And I think the two continuity guys on the film, they, they said to... Then, you know, you, we need a new second unit of it and to meet me. So I went to meet the, the, the producers and director and all that type of thing. And, um, and I was very polite. And yes, I said, but you know, I have to warn you, I'm almost certainly going to do something else. And uh, but thank you very much indeed, you know. And I left. And as I got my car, I drove to the front gate of the studio as it leaves, and the phone went from South Africa saying, a little bit of bad news, Peter, we've cancelled the whole commercial thing. I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> Without realising, I slammed on the brakes. I say, finish the call. I phoned back to the producer. I said, uh, I've been thinking. I said, I really should make a decision. I said, I shouldn't say I can let you know in a week. Uh, I can start tomorrow. And they said, oh, oh thank you. I said, of course, it's a, I mean, I did led to several years' work, which I did. At the time, I, I'd invested money in my own films to direct, which was the most stupid thing you could do in the world. So I was basically not totally broke, but I certainly needed um, money. That was the Harry Potter, which was a great experience. I think that's any more about that. that yeah, no, I was just going to say, I, you know, for, for a, an entire generation of people, Harry Potter has sort of lasted, hasn't it? I mean, my kids are in their teens and they're still visiting them now my six-year-old daughter is is discovering the books and and the films as well and i think those the, those films as much as they're blockbusters and everything they do kind of remind us of the magic of the movies and being able to immerse yourself in a world i've i've been i've been to the the studios a couple of times you know up at Leavesden there where they've got that permanent kind of installation up there and just the 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 effort and the endeavor that goes into creating those worlds never ceases to amaze me I mean, it's worked for you, but did it did it have a magical feel about it when you were working on it? I knew that it was special. And also, Stuart Craig, the designer, had, he, he'd invented that world. I mean, every set, he is a, a brilliant designer. And uh, you really believed, whether it was in you know, the big hall at this, at this school or locations, everything was, he'd really... More, I think more than anyone else, even more than maybe Chris, put a stamp of that look on it. You know, he's, he's, and he, she was great. He's a very quiet, humble man, you know, not at all like he works in some somewhat loud American production designers I work with. He was very quietly intelligent, got on with it, and it all worked, you know. I mean, I love the scenes in the hall with all, with like sometimes three or four hundred kids, you know, it was magic. And of course, you have all the teachers up here. 
<laughs> Maggie Smith, and we're all trying to outdo each other. They might all only have a line each, but they could uh, make that line last about half an hour. Well, I, it's, yeah. it's, it's lovely watching actors trying to slightly trying to upstage each other when they have very little to do and whatever they're going to do, they've got to. And of course, they're competing not only with the kids, and then we had to suffer with all the owls, you know, coming in. We just, there's one shot when the owls come in. I think like six or seven owls come in and drop the messages at the end of the table, you know. And the American animal trainers were incredible. I mean, I, I work with a lot of trainers. So, oh, yeah, we can do this. You, know, you want a polar bear to tap dance? Don't worry. I've got one I do. And you spend the next three weeks looking at polar bears and thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> anyway, the, with the, we did the shot with the owls coming in, and it was marvellous. And they dropped messages where they should. But one owl, a bit stupid, must have felt a bit cold because we had all these flambeaux and things around the edge of the set, these bowls with flames in it. He decided to drop his message, so he sat like a phoenix in these flames. Now, owls are a bit stupid. And suddenly I looked around and I saw this, you know, and, oh, my God, and the kids saw it. And now we've got 400 children. The girls are going hysterical and the boys are all laughing, but it's totally out of control. And the American animal man rushed in, grabbed hold of the owl, rushed it out through the big doors. I thought, oh, Jesus Christ. Came back a minute later with the owl saying, look, he threw him up there and he flew. It's safe. It's all right. And the car, the one clapped, you know. And I said, that's incredible. He said, it was a different owl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the owl didn't die. The owl, don't get me wrong. But I thought it was such quick thinking. Yeah, yeah. Good good job by the handler there. I think those films are great for, you know, seeing them through my kids' eyes. They're a great introduction to movies because they're now discovering all the other movies that that, particularly that adult cast have been in for the last 50 years, you know, they're like, oh, God, that's Professor McGonagall. Yeah, that's Maggie Smith, you know. And that, there's, yeah, that's Robbie Coltrane. And A, a very uh, good cast. I mean, it was a uh, lot of the top English um, actors, you know, so no, it, was, it was great. And it was, um, it's also watch, lovely watching the, uh, the main, the kids grow up, you know, because so uh, you watch them grow at least three or four years, you know, and it's, uh, and Dan was lovely. Dan is a was a beautiful man. He's a beautiful boy and a beautiful man. He's really highly intelligent. Understand filmmaking very well. I mean, I, I, I said to him, and we'll, we'll probably all be working for you one day. Dan. So he's uh, he was fun. Uh, Richard Harris could be <laughs> a problem sometimes, but I had done Cromwell with him. I I knew he could be an arsehole. But... Yeah, he's one of those sort of old school known to be a bit of an arsehole actors, isn't he? He's always, well, he's basically a bully, a bit like Oliver Reed was. So they're, they're looking for a challenge, right? He's much nicer than Oliver Reed was. Uh, but uh, he's, always, he's always all twinkling his eyes, seeing how much you can get away with. You know, but, um, but most of the actors were superb, just got on with their job. And um, sometimes it can be if one actor starts playing up, all the others think, oh, well, I can have some of this, I can also, you know, but it wasn't like it. So. It always strikes me as odd that the actors aren't trying to befriend, particularly the camera department, because ultimately ultimately, it's them that can make them look good or not. Yeah, I can't tell you, I worked up with one, act, well, I, I used the word actor, but he was he had quite a big part in the film, you know. And he was really, one night work we shoot, a huge night work with burning a whole village down, and I... I had a lot of my mind to distract and also and um, he was so rude to the cameraman, you know. And uh could come and said to me, we've got the whole thing, but this is really why you have to stand. He said, No one tells you where to stand, you know. He said, Well I'm not telling you, I'm asking you to stand. I said, uh, so I said, leave it out. I said, walk away from it. So I said, We're gonna shoot now. I said, you know, your mark is here, I said, and we're burning the village behind you. That's your decision. If you're on the mark, you'll be seen, but if you're over there, the camera's staying here. So I said, we hear you, I had to sound man on you. So I said, we hear whatever you're saying, but we won't see you. And he, he, he looked at what well, I said, that's the way it'll be. And so of course he came to his mark, and I said, well, how childish, why would you think? It's not as if we hadn't rehearsed beforehand. And suddenly, suddenly out of nowhere, 
that's where you stand in Dota. We'd rehearse. I said, you're happy with this because we've got a real big thing to get behind you. You've got an hour and a half now when you can go to your trailer or whatever because you've got to get ready to burn the whole this village down there. I thought, you are so. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know what it is with this the thing that, you know, match, I, I'm in charge, no one tells me what to do type of thing, you know. But it's not telling what I mean, I learned over the years, you know, and I have great respect, don't get me wrong, I have great respect for actors and work with some of the very, very best in the world, you know, and, and found it, you know, almost an honour at times, you know, to work with Olivia or Gilbert or Richardson, Cagney, these people, you know, I think, how, how good, I'm being paid and I'm working with legends, you know. I mean, also you work with Jean-Claude Van Damme and people like that, so you pay your dues. Yeah. Um, working as well on, I'm aware we've just gone over an hour here, Peter, so I won't keep you too much longer. Um, working as a second unit um, and working on a lot of these big films that have big action sequences, obviously... I think what a lot of people don't realise as well, watching it at home, that, you know, it's a precarious situation that you're putting people in and you're in as a crew. Um, I mean, I recently saw a a video of a stunt. Who was it? It was, a, was it Michael Bay, I think. It might have been Bay. He was shooting something and there's a huge explosion and there's extras and camera crew running left, right and centre. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you're, the are not... not- maybe cared I mean caring as much as he should. I mean I've always been anal about safety, you know. I mean I've never thought it's worse than anyone breaking an arm or a neck or even worse for a shot in a film, you know. And I I felt we were doing this huge tracking shot, must have been in Israel like on on Rambo and I had sorry, two or three hundred horsemen. So I had about thirty stunt horsemen in the front and 30 stunt horsemen at the back and in the middle normal good horsemen but not stunt guys no? and then we had this long road which we could track the tracking car on and that's three or four cameras on that and cameras could only could only do this once and I worked walk the course with all the lead horsemen so hidden from camera where each explosion was we had a kind of colored disc that they could see from a distance um, we talked, that's where the, and then I had the the special effect guy traveling with me on the tracking vehicle so he could see exactly, because if you at the wrong angle, you can't see what is safe and what is not safe, you know. And I took one of the cameras and I took the close, one of the close, because I wanted to be in amongst it. So I took the telephoto lens. We start the track and it's so exciting, but I'm seeing things bodies flying through frame and I dare open my left eye see reality that we came to the end of the track and we had these people called reenactors or a group of American writers that reenact for films they love it you know and I look as carnage as far as I can see it you know and uh, I the guy that ran it the colonel that ran the reenactors Came, I said, Peter, that was, I said, what? I said, I've seen so many people flying in the air, you know, and I'm st- all the time looking to see, could we have three ambulances in case of any problem? He said, no, they, they love all this, Peter. That's what we're here for, you know. And I said, no, we're not here to hurt anyone. And just then, behind him, a stretch went by with one of the horsemen on. And as he went by, he saluted on from a prone position, saluted, sorry, Colonel. I'm just going to hospital and I'll be back. <laughs> See, you're insulting them if you don't want to do this kind of thing. I could know I was hurt, you know, but it was a, but at one moment you said, oh, because you're dread of any, not any director, but most people like myself, is it, you're going to get the occasional collarbone or arm or something broken. You know, that's by the very nature of what we do. But what you're never going to want is anyone to be seriously hurt, you know. And that's a tragedy, that's a nightmare of your life, you know. That, uh, but all the members said, I'll be back, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you were right when you said they take it seriously. <laughs> oh, no. oh, no, they love it. I mean, he was, the only thing he was pissed off about is he missed the next shot, the, uh, the injured guy. But they were, I said, we don't have that in England, the reenactors. We don't, I don't think we do anyway, but 
and they, they travel all over to, to different shows. They're not just for film, you know. And they they just they look after themselves. They come. They have their own tents, bivouacs. Look after themselves food wise. Make their own call sheets. So they're there at six in the morning, and they rehearse it before you get there. I used to arrive at work normally thinking, especially with stunt guys, oh, where they're going to be. These guys were there rehearsing and getting it together, you know, and getting bollocked by the, the colonel if they weren't doing it uh, properly, you know. So that, that, that was a good experience. So, um, with somebody who's had a career like yours, I mean, look, if I look online at the list of the films that you've been involved with, I mean, it takes quite a lot of scrolling. There's, <laughs> there's a hell of a lot of titles there. I started very young. But yeah, I mean... Look, looking back over what you've done, what what sort of feelings do you have? You talked about, you know, you felt fortunate. Do you do you sort of have any sense of the sort of legacy of the work that you've done? Because I've spoken to a few people in the business and I generally let them know who I've spoken to before and who I'm going to speak to in the future. And you are very well regarded in the industry. You know, people see you as a very safe pair of hands to work with, uh, very creative, very dependable as well. Do you, how do you sort of view, if you were to sort of have an out-of-body experience for a moment, how do you look back on, on Peter McDonald and his career in film? Later on in life, when well, I was a camera operator for a long time, then I went directing. And every now and again, I'd have a, a camera operator that had a lot of opinions that, and I was like, oh, I don't like this. And then I thought to myself, that's where you've been. You were the 15 years. I said, how I didn't get whacked a few times. For 15 years, I've said, oh, we could do it that way, or should we do it properly? That's up a, di- a terrible dialogue. You know? Oh, you want to do it your way? Okay, I thought we would do it the right way. You know, now, I used to try this dialogue on. But um, I, I know that I enjoyed later when I found out I was, because I thought I was just doing a job, you know, and then find out that you were respected. And when I went to America, you know, your name was ahead of you, you know. People would be really much more respectful there than my mates would be in England, you know, or Spain. And uh, it was, I suddenly thought, Jesus Christ, you know, this kind of, not adoration is the right word, but the kind of disrespect was uh, more than, because I guess the way we shoot in England, it's, it's always been a bit of humour. And I say, I'd have people with me that, I'd known since I was 16 years old, you know. And at times, they give you a heart, they give you some dialogue, you know. And uh, <laughs> sometimes the Americans, what? You were getting dialogue from the grip, who was a man I'd employed and loved all my life. And he'd give me a, not nasty dialogue, but he put me in my place sometimes. And you could see him, like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, obviously, they're going to sack him, you know. And of course, Frankie, my girl, you know, we were mates, you know, and I loved the guy, you know. And I also, now and again, it was good. Someone to pull you back a bit, yeah. you know. Whoa, 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 you, you're only directing, you're not kind of a god, you know. So it's, um, <laughs> so it's, no, I, I, I miss it greatly, obviously, but I know I, physically now I, I, I couldn't. Uh, and I also now, because the last few times I worked, I heard so many times, I don't worry, we, we won't do it properly, we'll fix it later. And that was totally against every, every bone in my body, you know, because. I always went totally the opposite way. I would do anything. I always felt when you, and that's how things used to be, when you said it rushes, that's it. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes, you know, I Superman that, that you had to get rid of the wires and do things, but, you know, not much else. And they weren't going to CG figures, you know. And I know what they do now is superb. I mean, it's. A, I always feel it doesn't have the edge to shoot him with, what real people, as it were, gave you. Mm. But um, so I, I feel, I think in many ways I was very lucky that I, I was there during the, if I was doing something at the best of times, so when you could, you there's a way out with visual effects, but you were basically doing it for real, you know, was it Bridge Too Far or Superman or Star Wars? You know, you, it was done for real, and I always felt that... Um, and also, I think with actors as well, I mean, not not to put them in danger, but if they knew that something was coming behind, it wasn't a CG, it was a real helicopter or a bunch of horses. It's amazing the speed they could uh, <laughs> generate to get out of the way, you know. I mean, you always had to be careful, you're not, because you mustn't, there's no way you want to hurt anyone. I mean, I had a 
few times with producers. And I said, no, no, can't do this. I said, why? They're only stuntmen. And I said, what a stupid statement. They're only stuntmen. I said, oh, they're expendable. We'll get another five of those in. You know, so I would never, ever put anyone in the danger that I feel I wouldn't actually do myself. You know, they obviously, it was high dives and that type of thing. Then you get specialised people in stuntmen. That, that's their... That's their game, is you know, huge high dives, which I could, even to this day, someone I've seen, I thought, how the hell can you actually look down and think, I'm going to now dive into that uh, little bucket down below, which it looks like when you're up there. Yeah. And, you know, I think you, you give respect and you gain respect, and you know. And, uh, you know, I've stood up to quite a few producers now who said, no, you're going to do this. And I said, no, you know going to draw a line there this is not going to happen you know we're not going to we do this and it still be exciting but we're not going to uh, risk anyone's life or limbs you know so thank you peter for joining me i really appreciate your time and it's um it's an amazing career you've had and you know from all of us film fans on the other side of the camera i just wanted to say a big thanks for all your work that's very kind and I love the interview and I, I'd like to start again if I could in my film industry, not necessarily the interview. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much to DJ. Well, I hope you enjoyed my chat with Peter there. He really has such a grounded outlook um, but with so much humor and self-awareness and warmth how amazing to be 82 years old and still speak with such enthusiasm about his job and what he did his craft i had such fun listening to him talk and uh, i hope to do it again soon hopefully in person coming up soon on the film Entries podcast i do still hope to speak to colin goody he's had some stuff going on at home so we've delayed things for now um i have uh, an interview lined up with Gary Rydstrom. Have a look at Gary Rydstrom's IMDb. He works in the sound department on a lot of movies, and I mean a lot of movies. He's a multiple Oscar winner. It's going to be really interesting to talk to him. That's going to be coming up uh, in May 2021. I also hope to speak to Helen O'Hara about her book Women vs. Hollywood. I read it recently and really enjoyed it, and uh, it comes recommended from me. I was in contact with Howard Kazanjian again the other day. His book has been delayed slightly because of clearing rights for photos and things in the book. So that's been delayed until August, I believe now. So he said to get in touch nearer the time. So hopefully I'll get to speak to him later on in the summer. I'm still chasing up a couple of big leads as well. Um, it's going to take some time to kind of navigate my way through that. But rest assured, I've got uh, plenty up my sleeve here and I look forward to you joining me again for the next episode of the Filmumentaries podcast.